Welcome to the show, I'm Suleiman Alede. Tonight, Shino Fagbero Byron, Director of Operations OB Dati Presidential Campaign, joins me on the show to speak on issues around his candidate and the Labour Party. Stay with us. Politics HQ will be right back. You know, vying for a political office has to be one of the most tasking jobs in the world. From endless campaigns that take you to the nooks and crannies of the target population, to the mentally draining effects of answering the many questions, it is indeed work. Since the campaign flagged off for the 2023 election, we've seen Nigerian politicians travel far and wide, while the rich and the upper class board private jets. Their army of supporters join through various other means. Uh, for everyone, it is a demanding project. The death of a Nigerian lawmaker after the APC campaign commenced in Jaws is a pointer to the many problems that may be attached to a political quest. Physically draining, mentally exhausting, financially demanding, and sometimes morally tasking, political campaigns are not, after all, a jamboree. How should politicians and their followers approach campaigns? What is working and not working? How do we prevent untimely death? Pretty much later, we'll be speaking with some medical experts to help us uncover all of that. But now, let's talk about happenings around the Labour Party. Shino Fagmero Byron, who is the Director of Oppressions OB Dati Presidential Campaign, joins me live from Nigeria's capital. Good to see you, Shino, and thanks for your time as always. Now, you have been going around with other party members as well as your candidate. First up, uh, let us in on, uh, well, the latest back and forth between your candidate, Peter Obi, and uh, the governor of his home state, uh, Professor Soludo. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, Salai. Thank you for having me as always. Um, uh, thank you. It's wonderful uh, being in your studio, as it were, virtually. I would have loved to be there physically. Um, yes. Well, you know, um, as you've said, uh, anyone who knows the history of Anambra state politics would know that um, the what I call probably the rivalry between um, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party and uh, um, Dr. Professor Soludo, if yeah, I can call it actually a rivalry, started off when um, P.O. Um, Peter will be actually contested for the first time for the post of governor of uh, Anambra State. If you go back to the records, you would see that Soludo was in that race. Um, he was third or fourth, I think. So, uh, you know, you can understand that the towing and flowing between both of them and I would like to call it more of a sibling, um, um, you know, rivalry may not be, may not quite cut it. But these are things that happen. And um, it was only curious that at a time when, um, at this time, Soludo uh, brought out his issues. But uh, no one could have um, responded better than Peter would be himself, the way he did at the Lagos uh, Business School. And I mean, without wanting to write, reiterate much, um, Peter Obi has no issues, has no issues whatsoever with Soludo. He holds Soludo in high respect as he holds every other uh, public official and including private citizens. Uh, I know Peter, I have come to know him quite well as someone who respects diversity of opinion who defends diversity of opinion, having been in a, a position like that before. Um, he's explained that the component at which Soludo was referring to, in terms of the value of shares, was just about 5 to 10% of the entire investments portfolio that Peter was responsible for uh, in another state. And you and I know that between Peter and between Soludo, there were eight years of Ubiano. There were also eight years of 
macroeconomic policies that had nothing to do with his investment, nothing to do with the Anambra state, that affected investments everywhere. Um, we've had companies that have had shares that are valued at a certain thing at one point in time, and two, three, four years down the line, it could be matters relating to that particular sector, it could be matters relating to the economy generally. I mean, take for example, see what has happened, what was the dollar rate when those investments were made, and what is the dollar rate when they are went now? So anyone who's had, there is, I don't think there is anyone who made an investment at that time, and it was subject to the Nigerian, um, the vicissitudes of the Nigerian governance and Nigerian economy that hasn't lost a bit. So I think, you know, uh, Professor Soludo's statement was largely political. What he wanted to say was that he was not supporting Peter Obi, and what he was going to say that he was supporting someone else. Unfortunately for him, he did not tell us he was supporting his own presidential candidate. And that for me was rather sad, uh, which means that he was being opportunistic, you know, and, you know, and well, maybe in politics, it's okay to be opportunistic. But once again, let me say that he couldn't have gotten a better answer and Nigerians wouldn't have gotten a better answer than the answer and the responses that uh, Peter Obi himself gave. You know, Shana, let me let me jump in here because uh, you've all you, you're not uh, a newbie in politics. Uh, you've also ran for the highest office uh, in Nigeria, uh, being a one-time uh, presidential, you know, aspirant. And now, make for us, uh, you know, take us through uh, the rigors. Uh, we've seen your candidate, Peter Obi, going round, and uh, the very last uh, big event was at the. Lagos Business School alumni and uh, you know how important are these you know town hall meetings with different uh, groups uh, for your party well they're very important because you know we run campaigns and you engage people for several reasons number one you want to communicate with people and you communicate with people at different levels you also are concerned about the optics um, in terms of presence, facial recognition, uh, communication with masses, and at the same time, communication with smaller groups. The kind of conversations you can have at a rally is different from the kind of conversation you can have at town hall meetings. Usually town hall meetings are more issues based. People can listen to what you have to say, People can ask you questions and people can interrogate, you know, and possibly run verification checks on some of the things you say. That cannot happen during a rally. Having said that, you cannot neglect the rally, which is where the masses come to either show their support or show their dissatisfaction. The most important thing is that accountability of any person seeking public office starts with your readiness to present yourself to the people in the different categories they may be. The Lagos Business School, for example, we can understand there are going to be a lot of talk about the economy, which is a major issue. There's going to be a lot of talk about policy. And people have the opportunity to actually listen. For us, it is very important because we need to cover as much ground as we can. I hope I'm still on air. Thank you. No, no, I can hear you. you you're super much, uh, you know, I can hear you. But, but quickly here now, because you've always said something about making the campaign issues based, and that's, uh, that looks like what we've always seen with your party. But again, quite frankly, some have said the Labour Party is yet to... Uh, pull its uh, agenda together. Uh, help us uh, make sense of what this is about for the Liberal Party in terms of its plans uh, for Nigeria. The, 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 sorry. Can you hear me? You're breaking. I, I'm not sure. 
Well, it looks like I'm back. If I'm, if I am, if you can hear me quickly, uh, yes, yes. We're, we're talking about your manifesto, your plans, uh, plans you have for Nigerians. Perhaps uh, we should start to unpack them one after the other to see what you have. Is there a single document uh, of the Labour, Labour Party uh, that can actually point to Nigerians uh, its direction? Yes, um, you know there is a document, there is a manifesto which. Um, is about ready. Um, the difference between our manifesto and others is that the principal himself is chairman of the manifesto committee. I mean, he's played a significant role to that manifesto. Um, a pre-copy was published inadvertently, um, or should I say it was, you know, there were still a couple of things to be worked on particularly the graphics. So it had to be withdrawn. But I can assure you by this week, before the end of this week, very early next week, it will be out. It has seven points, you know, seven, seven major issues, right? I, can, I may not be able to reel them all off now, but of course, the primary one has to do with the restructuring of the nation. But I'll tell you what it is. It includes a huge element of social inclusion. It includes a huge element of turning around the economy by what his mantra has always been from consumption to production. It includes a huge amount that leverages on ITC and the dependency of the youth. It includes um, issues around foreign politics and geopolitics. It includes issues around um, you know, the, the, the basic sectors like agriculture, like health and education. Anyone who knows Peter Obi knows that there are three major areas he prioritizes. Number one is the reducing the cost of governance. And so you will see a lot of allusion to public financial management, anti-corruption and stuff like that. And the reason he's doing this is for the other two reasons that I would call priorities, education, and health. The truth of the matter is that development is measured by statistics and indicators that border on human development and human beings. So it's the human element. So it's a question of education, access to education, facilitating education for all, leaving no one behind. And of course, health with a bottom line on maternal and child health. Because health, I mean, it's the weakest, I mean, the strength of your health can only be measured where life itself begins. And life begins with the woman and the child. However, running as a mainstream within the agenda is the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which we are prepared to use as the monitoring and evaluation framework for our manifesto. So what it is, is very simple. The OB campaign and the OB presidency will be run in a manner that will be directly held accountable via indicators that are known, that are valid. And each of our issues in the, in the manifesto will dovetail into any of the 17 SDGs. But the principal mantra the principal mantra which we are trying to follow is that no one is to be left behind. You know, Nigeria has unfortunately uh, met itself where it is because we have for a long time run a government of exclusion. Government by the majority for the majority and only with the majority, not of the people. The point here is that we have to, and the way our manifesto is couched, which includes the how-to. So um, I will just tell you and assure you that within the next seven days, our manifesto will be out. The links will be sent around. People have an opportunity to interrogate them and hold our uh, candidate to account. There are two things he always says. He says, hold me to account. I will account for it. And and, uh, 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 on that premise, let me jump in here, yes, uh, you know, uh, apologies. On that premise, you know, Nigerians uh, have come to know that uh, 
its politics is uh, basically about personalities uh, more uh, than uh, of policies. Now, looking at the personality of uh, Peter Albee, as highlighted by you, uh, and you look at almost everyone in this particular election, uh, it's safe to say everyone has been tested. Uh, the, the PDP candidate, uh, the APC candidate, your candidate, they've all been tested. Absolutely. Now, so now let's yes. start by looking at personalities now. Uh, speak to us about the personality of Peter Albee. They will come back to the policies and uh, talk about that document which we uh, understand uh, will be out in a week or so. So the personality, how does it help your gain, uh, you know, that you're trying to put together for this big election? Okay. Well, I can speak to that. Um, there are two words that come to my mind when I think of the personality of Peter Obi. One is empathy, and the second one is hands-on. Now, you said quite rightly that the three major candidates have been tested and they have things that they are pretty well known for. Uh, former Vice President Atiku is known for his, um, his um, you know, his privatization policies, you know, and, and, you know, sort of, you know, big economy kind of stuff essentially the privatization policies. Um, Ashiwajibola Ahmed Tinubu is known for his capacity to generate revenue. Um, that's their major mantra. Um, Peter Obi's policy is more touching on the human being. The focus of a Peter Obi presidency is on the human being. That is why all his successes is attributable and recordable not in how much money comes in, but how that benefits the humans. It is the indicators, that is life expectancy. How many people are in school? What are the pass rates of school? What are the rates at which children are retained in school? What is maternal and child health? You see, so for us, it's a question of what is revenue if the revenue does not affect the people? And what is privatization if Privatization ends up in the hands of a few. We are talking about a presidential candidate who has demonstrated empathy for the people. And the bottom line is this. It is a question of who can you trust? Which one of them can you trust? It is a trust issue. And I believe many Nigerians, if not majority, very great majority, will probably trust Peter will be first. So trust is so on the, the so, so, so trust is on the table now. It is on the table. And, uh, and quite frankly, you know, um, uh, I had a conversation with uh, Delia Lake, who is a uh, media advisor to the APC yeah. candidate, and one of his uh, uh, thinking or growls is your candidate always talking about moving Nigeria from uh, a consumption nation to a production yes. nation. And he Absolutely. says, going back to looking at candidates, the antecedents of candidates, he thinks yes. that uh, Peter Obi has always been someone who patronizes consumption economy uh, against our production economy. And he, he questions, how can a man give you, give you what he hasn't actually been uh, so, you know, practicing. Uh, but my friend, Dele Aleke is a very good friend of mine, and he knows me very well. And I know that what he's saying is uh, the rhetoric that is commonplace. Now, consumption is a part and a factor of the economy. However, an economy shouldn't just be predicated on consumption. Those who are traders and suppliers and wholesalers are a part of the economy, and it is not illegal. However, we enter our private businesses based on the opportunities available, how we can seize them, and what the larger economy determines. A man like Peter Obi facilitated 
an economic environment in a number of states that birth innocent motors. Someone who facilitated an economy that has the largest motto manufacturing uh, company in the country today, who has also facilitated establishments including leather for shoes, you need to understand that it's not what you, you, it's like saying that because I'm a lawyer, that the only thing I will do in the economy is law. Or the only thing I will do if I become government is pay attention to law. I mean, you could see how ridiculous that can sound. Peter Obi is not responsible for the fact that Nigeria has become a consumer economy. You should go to the policymakers who have been making policy for macroeconomy. Peter Obi is not responsible for the fact that nobody is into production. You should go to the people who are in charge of generating power. You should go to the people who are in charge of making sure that the oil economy is dovetailed and put into uh, facilitate manufacturing. Peter Obi is not responsible for the fact that there are out of children out of school that cannot be trained to produce anything. So people who want to be funny can be funny on their own. That is semantics. And the two of Delhi will not stand in front of me and give me that story. None, none of them will do that. Because it simply is trying to be smart by half. A doctor, so a doctor cannot be, if a doctor becomes, you say, you're going to say a doctor who is, it's a good thing Peter Obi has not been accused of anything illegal anyway. Because I decide to open my shop and sell goods. I mean, my wife has a shop and she's a retailer. And she's contributing to our neighborhood. So, but the fact that nobody's producing the, uh, the Maggie cubes or the, or, the, or the shoes that she's selling within the neighborhood is not her, is not her fault. So for me, that's, that's just, um, it's water over the, you know, it's, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's political talk. Well, looking at the message coming in from AJK Okwa, a Nigerian-American based uh, in Texas, he thinks uh, that uh, Peter Obi should stop, and he thinks uh, uh, he does what he does a lot. Uh, let me give you a quote here. He says, he cowers before he counters. If Saludo made comments, he, Peter Obi, does not agree. He must counter effectively instead of the childish remarks. That's from AJK Okwa. I still have... Uh, Shino Fagmero Byron, Director of Operations, will be Dati Presidential Campaign. Now, some close watchers think that uh, in politics, you must actually uh, go for the juggler sometimes. But again, Fessa, before I let you come in on that, uh, would your candidate be willing to go on a debate on issues, especially on those five points that many Nigerians talk about, security, education, and of course, uh, and even the economy? Well, first of all, um, if there is one candidate who is ready to debate anybody, it's Peter Obi. And he has demonstrated this by showing up for every single debate he has been invited. Not all the candidates, we cannot say the same about all the candidates. So definitely he's ready. Now, now going back to what um, um, what's his name in the US said, yeah. you know, being a gentleman, being decent, being civil has become almost an endangered species in Nigeria. Everybody's expected to come out wild, to come out aggressive in a manner that does not um, all go well for anyone. Neither does it teach our children how to behave on television. The way our manner, Peter will be response, first of all, tells you what kind of a president we will have. Someone who respects people and does not have heirs because he's president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Peter Obi will not change the way he speaks. That is him, and that is why people love him. They love him because they see him as one of them. They love him because he does not have heirs. They love him because they see him as real. 
They love him because they see he is sincere. It is true that Soludo is his brother. There are several locations, and in the truth of them, why do we want to be aggressive outward and let our followers? Or why do we want to be? Why do we want to? Why, why do we want to, to to be aggressive outwards in a manner that will deceive our followers that there is more to it and we are fighting by calling Soludo? No, his brother. He's also asking Soludo's followers, asking his own followers who might be extreme, right, to temper their behavior. Peter was not happy at the way some people responded to Soludo. Every single campaign, every single presidential candidate has good, bad, ugly on their side. There are people who, if you talk about Ashiwaju anyhow, just even criticize him. They are ready to break bottle. The same with Atiku. So I, I don't know how long this aggression, this issue of being so uh, you know antagonistic towards each other because we are trying to make a point. I don't think it's helpful to Nigeria. And this is why Peter Obi is a breath of fresh air. It's the breath of fresh air that we all need. And maybe we should all learn from it. The person, I mean, my brother who is in the U.S. who is talking about, I mean, look, not everybody can be like Trump in a civil, I mean, I mean, there was, there's, you can say there's quite a bit of civility in the U.S. And once Trump started speaking the way he liked, talking down on people, uh, talking down on women, talking as if, you know, everybody had was stupid except himself. I mean, we saw how that felt on the people, on the psyche of the people. You know, I wouldn't want my children to follow that. I would rather have my children to follow the kind of example Peter Obi is following. You respect people even if they are not in the same side. Now, we can if if it is about how people talk, we we don't want to go down that lane to talk about how some people talk. Or else, you know, some people wouldn't even be able to talk anymore if we really talk about how they talk. So you have a gentleman who respects people and it comes naturally with him and i don't think he's gone we are not we don't want him to change the way he talks the people understand him he doesn't have any accent he doesn't have any affectation and he does not say because he has been two-time governor and he's an extremely successful human being that he's going to talk on somebody else or he's going to show face others and that is the arrogance of power that we want to to, to, to get rid of. No, no, Probably no, no, some people might say... Let, let's throw this in know, now that you're talking about... Uh, the, you know, yeah. now, let's throw this in now you're talking about the people. The people love him yeah. the way he speaks. The people love him the way he is. Uh, and you've been going around uh, specifically with the yes. your candidate. Uh, how is the acceptance like? First, uh, some did say, uh, you, of course, you, you've been in politics. They talk about a structure. Uh, they still yeah. think that your party, uh, the Labour Party, has no base, no structure in some geopolitical zones in the country. You see, people who talk like that, well, some people are, you know, they're, you know, it's, it's, it's to them it's a valid observation, and they don't mean any harm. But there's some people who talk like that because, um, you know, they rely on more on the structure than on content. In the first place, some of the structures, I am sorry to say, but it is a fact. Some of the so-called structures are structures of organized crime. They are structures that prevent good people from getting into power. They are structures that form themselves into gatekeepers to make sure that the proper issues are not brought into, into the fore. What do you mean about a structure that does not allow women to attend meetings? How do you call a structure that the only time they meet is 12 midnight? That is on one side. But it is also realistic that you need to have things like organograms, you have things like people you report to, information flow, organizing stuff. As a campaign uh, director of operations, I understand what it means by structure. However, there is another side to this. What is driving the Labour Party now and Peter Obi is a movement. 
It is a movement. It is almost a revolution. And movements do not have structures. There is nowhere in the world you will find a movement that has a structure. And I recall that at some point in time, in 2019, when we were running, right, people told us that the only thing that could upstage the conservatives, the people who had been in power forever, was a movement that was outside the ambit of a political party. So what is happening, and the truth be told, is that the movement, the Well, you know, it looks like I, I lost you for, for a bit there. Uh, we just lost the connection to Shino, who's uh, speaking with us from Nigeria's capital, Abuja, while well, he's director of operations of uh, the uh, Peter Obi uh, Dati campaign. And uh, he's been speaking to us about the movement which many Nigerians spoke about in the last election, specifically 2019 election. And uh, he's liking the movement or the campaign trail of uh, the Labour Party to that movement that many spoke about, whether you call it the third force or not. But once he comes back, he should be able to let us in on how this is. Oh, I can see you back, uh, Shino, for a bit. I, I lost you there. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, good yes, that you're back. I, I, I was taking us back just the way you, where you left off. Uh, 2019, yeah. many Nigerians first, it was termed the third force, then pretty much later changed to the movement. Do you think your party exactly. is that movement Nigerians spoke about in the last election, 2019? The movement, the, now, the party is now the vehicle of the movement. The movement existed. The movement is crystallizing. There is a bigger groundswell. But you cannot go into an election as a movement. So the movement has adopted Labour Party. Do you follow me? And between you and I, Labour Party has a history. It is building. It is emerging. And let me tell Nigerians something. We want something new, and something new, anything new has to grow. It has to grow organically. It has to grow structurally. And it has to grow in a manner that it does not, it learns the lessons of the previous parties that have failed us. Nigerians do not want Labour Party to make this, to become another PDP and APC. And so they cannot expect us to do the things the same way. Having said that, we are constrained by what Nigerians want, a ground swell. Nigerians want to escape from an imminent disaster that we will return to, I can assure you, if either of APC or PDP enter. Because it will either be a continuation of the progression that has happened, if it is APC, or if it is PDP, virtually the same thing on the flip side, because I have said in several fora, PDP is a party that does not listen, neither do they learn. And this is the problem. And this is why Nigeria has been parabolated. And again, and again, you know, you, you also agree that this looks like deja vu. Nigerians have seen this before. It, it looks very much Ooh. like when Nigerians were looking for a vehicle, you know, to drive the movement. And they thought then it was the APC uh, on their President Buhari, then a candidate. So th they felt that the uh, APC was bringing the change. So what's that difference, uh, you, Nigerians? I will tell look, you the difference. Uh, no, no. I what's that you. difference, Nigerians should look out for, uh, yes. that can actually, uh, you know, tell the APC from what the Labour Party is bringing before the people. The 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 difference is the young people. The difference is the future of Nigeria. This one is being driven by the young pe young people. As you, as you see me, right, apart from my own um, love, my appreciation of what Peter Obi tries to do, I'm a development expert, 30 years plus. Um, I am older than Peter, but I am gladly doing this because I know that this is what my children want. And this is the difference. Nigerians were slightly impatient in 2015. And they were even less aware. And I'm well, 2019 election for me, as far as that, because that election was horribly rigged. But in 2015, 
And many of us warned against 2015 because the combination of ACN, which at that time was the non progressive party that was driving restructuring, when now went to com combine with CPC, that is, you know, on the opposite side. And this is why their recipe, their combination was the recipe for disaster. And we made mention of that fact at that time. But you see, media, those who control the media then, are those people who are in, who, who combined to form that party. So, so it was, it was, it, it, it was a bad marriage bringing the CPC and the ACN at that point in time to yes. form the APC. Yes, they were ideologically opposed. It's like somebody walking forward and another person walking backward, and you join them together. One of them will continue walking backward if they are going to go to move in rhythm. And that is why restructuring was in their, in their manifesto, but they denied restructuring when they got there. That was why some of them participated in the national conference. And when they got there, they threw the national conference document of 2014 into the dustbin. And that is why in the history of APC, there is no sector in that government, foreign affairs, health, education, agree that you don't have internal conflict. Go and look at the records. And that is why they have not been able to perform. And shouldn't that, shouldn't, shouldn't that also worry you, uh, Shino? Again, because now, some sense of logic here. Looking at yeah. your party, uh, some yeah. of those who have come together in the Labour Party were first and foremost some members. Your candidate was once upon a time a member of the PDP. So PDP, yes. uh, oh, uh, 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 a few are grieved uh, members of the, of, the, uh, of the APC, and uh, they're all together. So... Uh, what are those things uh, you think you can put in place that will ensure that you don't have a repeat of what you just highlighted as uh, already uh, been experienced? Good. Number one, the leadership. The Peter will be factor himself is very significant. Number two, the groundswell and the movement, right? There are a series of things that have happened in this country over the past four to five years, including NSARS, which was an expression, right, by the younger generation, that they will no longer be stifled, that they will no longer be intimidated by the force of arms and government. And then that also the third force, which have never been slept, you know, led by people like Pat Tomi, Wale Okuni, Olisa, Bakoba, all of us have been trying to see how we can make some sense. So when these three combine, right, or should I say four or five other such groups, many of whom are silent, what I call the moral majority in this country, the silent majority, they are the ones that have come up. ACN was a structured party. It had its ideology. It was doing things. CPC was another party. It had its ideology, and we knew what it stood for. Now, because of political expediency, they forgot those things and they joined it together. Right? I will not compare the leadership of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, President Buhari with any other leadership. I knew President, I finished my youth call when President Buhari came in 1984. Many people will tell you that there is no difference between when he was there and now. And some of us did warn. We warned that, look, General Buhari is a gentleman. He's a fantastic human being. But there are certain shortcomings, principle of which is the inability to manage diversity. And that is a critical thing for leadership in Nigeria. If you cannot manage diversity, you have no business in government. However, but, 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 he's not, he, but he's not on the ballot. Uh, so No, 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 no. I was sorry, sorry. I only made reference to that to tell you because you asked me what's the difference between then and now. And I said leadership. Okay, leadership. leadership. And I said leadership was a factor. Ideology was a factor. Ground swell. You know, because the followers also lead. The people can also lead. They say a nation gets the leaders it deserves. So what has happened is that 
the leadership, the groundswell that is driving Labour Party, driving Peter Obi, is a groundswell that is very, very powerful and is very clear as to the kind of Nigeria we want. We want a Nigeria that works for all. A Nigeria that works for all. Who is not suffering from insecurity right now? Who is not suffering from the foreign exchange, the, 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 the poor economic policies? And it's not personal. It's, because, it's not because we don't like, I mean, I'm a Yoruba man, I love Bola Ahmed Tinubu, but I don't think he will, I, 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 I don't support him for being president. He was fine as governor, but that's all. And that time he's gone. He is not a president for tomorrow, he's a president of yesterday, and yesterday is gone. We are looking at Nigeria for tomorrow, and Nigeria for tomorrow deserves something else. And so, Peter uh, provides so, that. So, so uh, let's see if we can actually close on this. Uh, you, you've yes. been able to draw, uh, you know, some comparison, also highlight, taking us back in time, talking about the uh, CPC, the ACN coming together, also letting us know what uh, your political party stands. Uh, uh, you know, to gain, uh, you know, on what Nigerians stand to gain from voting That's your right. party. Quickly here, security is very important. Uh, you've, yes. you, we, we can't gloss over that. Uh, you know, every time yes. no. uh, we've heard your yeah. candidate speak, he, he speaks about security. Yeah. But many Nigerians yeah. are saying, still, he's not been able to tell the country how he's probably going to unlock, you know, uh, the problem and bringing solution to fixing what Nigerians are going through at the moment. So, uh, you know, uh, if you can, uh, yeah. before we close, uh, let us in on what the Labour Party has for Nigeria, uh, looking at security and how it also affects its neighbours. Well, okay, you said little party, little party, big people. No, no, little I said, party, uh, no, no, I said Labour Party. I didn't say little. Oh, all right. I was only pulling your leg. I too was pulling your leg. Anyway. All right, you, you got you me know, there. You know, yeah, Nigeria's security issues uh, have a lot to do with certain failures and the security architecture of this country, some of which borders on what the structure of the country is. So, in the first place, understanding the fundamental causes. There is also a very uh, uh, direct line between poverty and unemployment and a bad economy and the security challenges of this country. There is also a linkage between how you deploy and uh, mobilize and demobilize men of the forces. There is an issue around accountability within the security forces. Now, nobody will come on television and tell you how he's going to organize the security. Nobody is going to do that. But I can tell you those broad headings. Number one, leadership. A man doesn't perform, you replace him. I'll ask you a question. For how long has some of our senior men in the armed forces been on seat, even while the situation has gone from bad to worse? For how long and how has this government used the information, intelligence information supplied by the DSS and the NIA? You see, because security is first predicated on intelligence. Secondly, the best security are the people themselves. You cannot have a situation whereby the people are not confident of the, their own relationship with their own proximate security institutions and expect them. Another thing is justice. Insecurity is birth. Did I, did I, it looks like I lost that just while, as we were rounding up. I hope uh, Shino can come back so that we can close properly. Uh, uh, the Labour Party uh, Director of Oppressions, uh, Shino, uh, uh, is trying to let us in on what uh, the political party will may likely do if elected uh, in Nigeria's next election uh, as to what it will do to fix in the security challenge. I see that Shino is back. Shino, 
uh, let's quickly do this and and call it a day. <laughs> Okay, two, three points to just conclude. Number yes. one, security is a question of leadership, decision making. It's a question of intellect, intelligence gathering. And I'm asking, how do we use our intelligence? It's a matter of structure. It's a question of how coordinated security agencies are. Security agencies that work at cross purposes that don't share information, that's a problem. There are also accountability, right, of security agencies and security forces. And let me just put it that way. No one is going to come and talk about security on the air. No one is going to talk about security on the air. Uh, and, uh, quick, uh, <laughs> quick, uh, and quickly, you know, being a development expert uh, of many years, uh, we, we've had conversations in time past uh, talking about some of the key things that Nigeria and uh, some other African countries should do to revamp its economy. Uh, uh, what's the conversation like in your camp, uh, especially when you have you know, some village square meetings with uh, uh, you know, the electorates? Uh, what are the conversations around economy, uh, unemployment, and of course, uh, small-time business people? OK, I'm glad you mentioned that. Small-time business people, access to finance is the major thing, access to finance, certainty of policies. On the larger scale, we are entering the fourth industrial revolution. Nigeria is not taking advantage of it. We are very well cited on that. Um, we have a raft of some of the best economists, some of the best people working on that. And um, all you need to do is just be patient. In the next one week, you'll see our manifesto and you'll interrogate us in full. I'd like to thank you for your time, Shino Fagmero Byron, Director of Operations OB Dati Presidential Campaign. Many thanks for speaking thank with us on Politics HQ.